you have a Bible, open up to the book of John. We're going to start our series tonight, Believe and Live. If you guys are like me, I like working through books of the Bible, and I like to see what God has to say. And the neat thing about this, his hand is still plugged in. I was going to stop it, but it was too cool to watch, so it was just better just to see it happen. So John chapter 1 is where we're going to start. Hey, so if you have a Bible, hold John chapter 1, and I have some leaders positioned around the room. They're going to pass out some napkins to you, and you're going to need a pen as well as a napkin. So just get ready for that. They're coming to you. Griffin's got the pens. <clears throat> Don't complain about not having one yet because it'll make its way to you. Book of John is one of the coolest books in the Bible, and here's why. While they're passing out, shh, just take them and listen. The book of John is one of the Gospels that falls inside the four Gospel set, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right, we all remember our books of the Bible. Some of us are like, what are you talking about? So the neat thing about John is John starts in an, in an entirely different way than any other Gospel does. And he starts with presenting Jesus well before he is born. Now you're like, well, how is that even possible? We're going to start there. We're going to work our way through what is John trying to communicate. He's writing to a specific audience. He's trying to introduce the person and work of Jesus from a very different perspective. And there are three guys in Jesus' life. We're going to see them later. And John calls himself the, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved the most. John had a very high view of himself. But here's the reason. It's not because he's like creepy, arrogant and stuff. It's because he got to spend time with Jesus in a way that no one else did except for James and Peter. There were three guys who went up on a mountain with Jesus, and they saw Jesus change. They saw him in his glorified state. They saw Jesus in a way no one else did. They saw him in, in bright and shiny clothes. They were like, oh my goodness, this is really who Jesus is. So when John writes his gospel, he writes it from a perspective of seeing Jesus in a way that no one else had except for two other guys who were preaching and teaching and leading other churches. James was not James' his half-brother. It's James, the son of who? And his brother's name was what? John. There you go. It's a trick question. It's not. And then Simon Peter was also there, who we know from Scripture. If you know anything, you know the story of Jesus. When he dies, Peter is the guy who gives him away. He sells him to the, the, the officials who are going to arrest him for 30 pieces of silver. Not like that's actually Judas. But Simon Peter does something really interesting. He denies Jesus, which is a part of the whole process. Judas sells him, betrays him. Simon Peter rejects him, ignores him, denies him or knowing him. So these three guys, they write some really powerful books. And John has written the Gospel of John. And there's also three letters at the tail end. And then something at the end of the Bible. There's a book at the end that tells us how the story ends. Have you ever seen it? It's not called the end. It's called Revelation, right? It's a really cool. It's an unveiling of God's plan for the end of days. If you really want to wrestle your brain and... Try to go to sleep at night after reading something really fun. Just go read Revelation because it'll keep you up, maybe, or give you some really cool dreams. Anyway, in the middle of John, and, and towards the end of the book of John, is actually the next to last chapter. If you have John chapter 1, hold your finger there and turn to John chapter 20. If you don't know where that is, look on with a friend and neighbor. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. And here's the reason we've titled this series what we've titled it. Believe and live. Because when Jesus, when, when Jesus inspires John to write this gospel, here's what he says in verse 30. I love, this, I love this section. It's amazing. 30 and 31, really powerful verses. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. So everything that John's going to write, we're going to study this fall up until we get to Christmas. You're like, really? The book of John for three months? Absolutely. We could study this book for three years and never finish it. So you get to John chapter 20, verse 30, and here's what he says. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. There's a bunch of other stuff that Jesus did that are not written down. Why is that? Because if they did, it would fill the world. The world's not big enough to hold all that Jesus did. And in verse 31, here's what he says. But these... When he refers to these, he's talking about everything I wrote, everything that's in here, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You ever heard that before? Jesus is the Christ. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who said that? Well, what? Peter. There's a statement that we make. It's Peter's confession. 
Jesus is asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And finally, Peter, the, the guy that gets it wrong, he gets it right and he says, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes and blesses him and, and gives him a new name. It's a really cool process. But here he says, you may believe, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, listen, not only will you believe, you're going to have life because of him and his name. You're going to believe who he is, hopefully seeing all that he's done. I'm going to share with you who he is, where he came from, and that's going to move you to see him in a different way. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about me. I grew up going to church. You guys know that. But here's what I grew up seeing in the rooms in the Sunday school classes when I was a kid. You want to know what it was? Pictures of Jesus. And what, what do we see of pictures of Jesus? What do they have? They, they got Jesus sitting down with more kids, and they're crawling all over his lap, and he's and he's fair complected, and he's got blue eyes, and he looks a lot like a European guy or an American. I'm going to give you a little clue. That isn't at all what Jesus would have looked like. He would have looked like a, a Middle Eastern man, probably one that we would go, ooh, I don't know about that. And he's looking kind of kind of off, right, today. We would look at him and go, I'm not sure if I want to follow him. That's not the Jesus that I see on the wall. But in this, I want you to take that image, whatever image you've got in your mind of Jesus, I want you to set it aside. Because the point for this series is that we would see who Jesus is, that we would believe that he is the Son of God, and that by believing we would have life in his name. So John chapter 1, turn back. This is going to be fun. I love this book. Why do I love this book? Because it starts where I believe everything should begin. In the beginning. John chapter 1. Everybody stand with me. We're going to read this together. Woo! There yeah. we go. Woo! Woo! That was awesome. All right, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the joy we have in, in digging into the truth that you provided for us. The unchanging, perfect, sufficient, complete word of God. It has stood the test of time and it will into eternity future. We, we know that you've given it to us so we could see all you have done. And this story that we're going to study this year is going to show us exactly who we have believed in. God, I pray our minds would be open. Our hearts would be receptive. I pray that your words would remain and mine would fall to the ground. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I wanted to show you a quote. You guys know that I like quotes from people. I like to read old dead guys because I think they were a lot smarter than a lot of living guys. Um, some of them, anyway. There's an old dead guy that I like. His name's Charles Spurgeon. And here is a quote from him. Do you have that up there? Go back. Oh, there it is. Next, next screen. I have a great need for Christ. And I have a great Christ for my need. Listen to this. I have a great need for Christ. But I have a great Christ for my need. You're like, well, that's like a cliche statement. But it's so true. When we see Jesus for who he really is, we will settle for nothing less than who he is. When you see Jesus for who he is, notice the word I'm using, not see Jesus for who he was. Because I believe in this room, if you're sitting here, you belong to Christ. You have understood the truth that Jesus did die on the cross. He was buried and was raised on the third day. And he's alive and well today, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He makes intercession for you and I say, I died for them. They're mine. And here's the, here's the joy. When we see Christ for who he is, we'll settle for nothing less than who he is. What does that mean? If you miss seeing Jesus for who the scriptures say that he is, we're going to start with where John starts, where the Bible begins in the very beginning, before time existed. When we see Jesus for who he is, we will want nothing less. And I would ask you this question. If you desire anything else other than Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, I question, have you met him yet? Because when you see him and you experience a life with him, it will change you completely. I had a, a great conversation with um, someone last night, and I left that, that conversation, that meeting. I was going home. It was time to go home, and I, 
I just, man, I gotta, I gotta come back here. I didn't leave here till 11.30 last night. I was walking, praying, praying through the building, praying through this message. Guys, let me tell you something. This passage of scripture has gone to work on my heart at least 50 times in my adult life. I love this passage. Why is it? Because it shows me a fresh picture every day, every time I see it, exactly who I have believed in. He's more than just a man. More than a, a passing word. And when we see Jesus for who he is, we will want nothing less than him. And our worship will be pure. Our actions and our attitudes will match that. Because we will want nothing less than to please our, our Savior and our King. You may think this is a silly thing and you're like, what is he talking about? We're going to see it in just a second. First thing that I think a lot of us miss I missed it for a long time, and I hope we don't miss it collectively as a group. Jesus is not simply a part of creation. He's the creator. Don't miss this. When we see Jesus dying on the cross, it's not as if he came into existence at Christmas time. Here's, here's what we love. We love to sing songs about a little cute little baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. It's a sweet time. We buy new clothes. We give each other presents. We decorate with Christmas lights because it's a sweet time of year, right? Oh, baby Jesus, right? And then, guess what happens? Two months later, it's February. It's cold. No one remembers baby Jesus anymore. Then we get to Easter. Oh, man, we're going to celebrate Jesus. He's, he's been crucified and buried to come out of the grave. If there is no manger, there is no cross and no empty tomb. Right? But guess what? Jesus lived before he was born. What are you talking about? Listen to what it says, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. This term that that means, the pre-existent, what it means to be God. Jesus existed and He was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. They had relationship and fellowship. I want you to see this. You guys have done this study with me before, the person and work of Jesus. If you know this, somebody turn to Colossians chapter 1. Go ahead and do that. Somebody in the room say, I got it. All right, Colossians chapter 1. And somebody turn to Genesis chapter 1. Anybody? Okay. All right, so I got two people on each side of the room. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So not only did they have relationship, but the very essence of what it meant to be God existed in the Word. What is that Word? That Word is a preexistent Son of God, the person we know of as Jesus. When He was born, that was a name given to Him in ages past. That name was prescribed for the Savior, the King. When it, we call him Jesus, the Christ, it literally means Jesus, the Savior. He will save his people from their sins. And that was predetermined from the beginning of time. There's never been a time when Jesus didn't exist. And there will never be a time when he ceases to exist. I need you to get that. When he was born, he had already existed. And when he died and rose again, he will exist into eternity future. He sits ready to, re to receive us those who have trusted Christ, and he stands ready to redeem anyone who's ready. He is still alive, and he will be when we meet him one day. We're going to celebrate two uh, going home for folks in our church. Two members of our church passed away this week, and I'm going to tell you something. Funerals are hard, but they are both going to be celebrations. Why? Because we believe that those who die in faith have their faith has been made sight. The moment they stop breathing here, they enter into eternity. Perfect body, perfect existence and they have seen Jesus. Nothing else will matter. Believe me, when you see Jesus for who he is is existing for that long, when you when you die, your concern will not be for your your aunt and your uncle and your grandparents. It will be I just want to see him. I want to see him because he's there and he's ready. Jason, read for me Colossians. You have Colossians 1, right? Yep. All right, Colossians chapter 1. I need to get the passage out that I want. He probably already knows it. There you go. Colossians 1:15. He's ready. Go for it. Read it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, mm -hmm. all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay, stop there. Genesis chapter 1. You know where I want to go? 1-1 one, one through 1-3. Read that to us. Remember what I said? In the beginning was the Word. 
The word is with God. The word was God. Who do you think said the word, let there be light? That's what it says. The term in Genesis 1 for God literally means uh, there's, there's, a, there's more than just one being going on there. So that's where we see the first picture of the Trinity in Hebrew. It's a, it's a plural word. It means, hey, there's, there's more than one thing happening here. The word for God in, in Hebrew is El, right? You would say El, that's God. The ending on that word means there's more than just one. There's, there's a plural thing going on here. We know from the New Testament we see the Trinity. How does that work? Father, Son, and Spirit. See, Jesus gives glory to the Father, and the Spirit draws men to himself. Isn't that cool? That's how they work together. Genesis 1, you have, you have all persons of the Trinity working there. You have God creating, the Son speaking, the Spirit hovering. You see that? And God says, let there be light. Boom, there it is. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The world we live in, I'm going to help you with something. There are pictures of who Jesus is in this world that are going to be very confusing for a lot of us. I have some research that I want to show you. If we can flip to that, um, we're going to do that in just a second. I have a napkin illustration. Do you have your napkin with you? All right, so I want you to open that up. You're like, just two sides. Let me, let me see, I'll show you. All right, see where it's naturally folded in the middle? Just do this right here. Hold it up like this. All right, where the fold is in the middle, I want you to draw a line down the middle, okay, with your pen. Don't tear it. Don't be goofy. Just do what I'm asking. All right, now, at the top of that, I have some images for you. Samantha, go ahead and the first one up there for me. All right, at the top of the napkin, between both sides, span both sides, everything that exists. I'm going to help you with something. This is, this is to help you in a conversation with someone who argues that Jesus did not always exist. As a matter of fact, he is brand new when he's born. We're going to help, I'm going to help you with that. Everything that exists on one on, at the top, show us the next part. All things that never came into being. I'm going to help you with that. What it means to come into being, it means to have a beginning. In the beginning, what existed? That's the question we're asking, right? Okay, that goes there. Next slide. God. I'm going to help you with something. When, when God says in Exodus, he asks, Moses asks him, who will I say is going for me? Or who will I say I'm going for? And God says, I am. Tell them I am sent you. What that means is he needs nothing to exist and never will need anything to exist. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He is perfectly happy in himself. He is self-sustaining, life-giving, and life-taking. He can do anything he chooses. That is the one being that never not existed. He never came into being. He always has been. All right, next slide. All things that came into being. Now, what do you think fits in that category? Hit it. All created things. All right. So I'm gonna, I wanna, we're gonna walk through John chapter one, verse three. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, stop. What did you hear? All things were made through him. So who made all things? Tighten that phrase. Jesus, right? Talking about him. It's, it's about Jesus. We're telling the story of the good news of Jesus, right? It's where the gospel starts. What did he create? Read the Bible. Verse 3. Don't no, no, no. read it. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So did he ever stop existing? If you take your pen, I want you to do me a favor. Now you have those things written down on your napkin. Do you have it? You write it down, or how many of you guys are lost? You're like, I didn't get it. Go back. All right, there you go. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what we're going to, um, it's a test, but you're all going to pass. I'm going to help you cheat, okay? Here's the question. Everybody have it written down? Three, two, okay, not yet. You're not, are you pen quit working? Okay, you get a pass. All right. Which side, of the, which side of the napkin does Jesus belong on? All created things or God? Was Jesus created? Mm. Mm. What did I just say? 
He never not existed. You're thinking in his body. That's human flesh. The person of Jesus never not existed. You gotta, you gotta think about it this way. If he is God, he can never have a beginning and never have an end. God is infinite and so is Christ. Now here's the deal. If Jesus is infinite, how secure is your salvation? Completely. If he can't die and he holds everything in his hand and he's secured your salvation, how secure is your faith? It is 100% secure. You have nothing to fear. But if your God can be created, if Jesus can be created, he can be fashioned by someone else. He's not God. He's something else. So here's the deal. All things that never came into being, he always existed. Right? Is Jesus here? Or is he here? Helping you. He's there, right? He never came into being. He always was. He just took on flesh, right? We're going to read the rest. Look at verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. As we go through this book of the Bible and the Gospel of John this fall, there are themes that are going to pop up for John all over his letters. And there's two, two big ones I want you to see. Light and darkness... And life and death, those, those, two, those two themes, they're two subjects, light and darkness. He will actually ask a question in first John, what fellowship does light have with darkness? None. What fellowship can light have with darkness? It can have none. What about life and death? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He's transitioning the conversation about who Jesus is. Now, what I want to note, in order to grasp a better picture of Jesus. We can't look to what the world says because here's what the world says. Let's put those up there, Samantha. The task is hard for us today to see Jesus as he is. Here's some, some notes that I got. Here's a, a, a little graph for you from the Barna Group. Research was done by George Barna. 90% of Americans say Jesus was a real person. Would everyone in this room say that? Jesus was a real person. You may fall. See how many people agree with you? Jesus was a real person. 90% of Americans would say that Jesus was a real person. The next slide shows us that younger generations are increasingly less likely, likely to believe that he was God. As a matter of fact, 44% say that Jesus was just a good leader, a good man. So that Jesus was a real person, they'll give you. Jesus was a great leader or a good man, but a man nonetheless. He was not the God-man, not divine. Next, Americans are divided on whether Jesus was sinless or sinful, just like you. 50% of Americans agree that Jesus sinned. Here's what's even scarier. Those who say that Jesus was a real person, they place their faith and trust in Christ, that doesn't change. Yeah, he had sin. He was human. What? Then the cross was pointless. Because he didn't kill sin there. He just died. Brutally. For sins he committed. The next one, most Americans say that they have made a commitment to Christ. 60% of Americans in 2016 said they had made a commitment to follow Christ. 6 out of 10. That means 6 out of 10 people in your class, 6 out of 10 people on your team, 6 out of 10 people in an airport when you travel or in a, in a mall when you shop or wherever you go. And on average, 6 out of 10 would say, I have made a decision to trust Christ. And some are like going, no way, no how. What does that commitment to Christ look like? If we look at the numbers and trace it down, here's what it means. 60% made a commitment to a man who is not the God-man who died and had sin. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Do you see this? See how dangerous this is? 90% say, I believe that Jesus was a real person, but a person nonetheless. And he sinned, and I've made a commitment to follow him. He's nothing more than Muhammad or Gandhi. Do you understand what I'm telling you? He's a great teacher, like one of the Buddhas. There's several of them. But here's the deal. Jesus is set apart by every possible way. He was not created. He was begotten, not made. He took on flesh. He didn't have to. He chose to, to redeem sinful flesh, to die once for all for sin, to set you free. He is unlike any other religious leader that's ever lived and ever going to live because he was the God man. The last one that I want to read to you, this fires me up. Can you tell? We cannot miss Jesus. The last one. People are generally conflicted about Jesus being the only way to heaven. As a matter of fact, it is so confusing, you can't even measure it. 
See how low those numbers are? Among those who have made a personal commitment to Jesus, go to heaven because you have tried to obey the Ten Commandments, because you've confessed your sin. That's the largest number on there. But people believe that I can obey the Ten Commandments and make it. Guess what? You can't. Let me help you with that. You already failed. You lied. Not go to heaven at all. Some of them agree that. Right here. I don't know what will happen after I die. The Bible tells me right there. When I die, I step into eternity. And there's something waiting for me on the other side. It's either heaven or hell. And I promise you, it's coming. Don't be mistaken. Go to heaven because God loves all people and will not let them perish. God does love all people, but he sent his son to die for them. And based on faith and trust in that work, they will spend eternity with him. But it's not about heaven. Please hear me say this. Heaven is icing on the cake. That's the end game. If you wait till your deathbed to trust Christ, you have missed all of the life God wanted to give you. Eternal life does not start when you stop breathing. It begins when you trust Christ. Amen. That's when life starts. You will have life in his name. And if you wait that long and play games with Jesus, you will have wasted your life playing a dangerous game. Because heaven is not the goal. Please hear me say this. Jesus is. If Jesus is the goal, heaven doesn't matter because he's already there. He didn't die to take you to heaven. He died to set you free. He died to give you hope and future and life as he meant for you to live it without sin. With him. So if your hope for trusting Christ is I get out of hell free card and I go to heaven, you did not trust the Jesus of the Bible. Some of you are like, what? They told me if I prayed a prayer and signed the card, I was good. It was a good number. A lot of people walked out of aisle. 60% of Americans say, I believe in Jesus. 90% say he was a real man. But how many? It's so confusing. He'll go to heaven because God loves all people. You go to heaven because you're basically a good person. Those are the same lies that people tell you every day. I don't need Jesus. And if we fail to see Jesus as he's presented in the scriptures, we will fail to engage him because we'll believe it too. We will believe it too. Here's the truth that I know from the scriptures. That God was so moved for compassion for his creation that he sent his son to die on a cross meant for a sinful man, a murderer. See, the cross Jesus bore was meant for Barabbas and he died in his place. He died in my place and in your place to forgive us of our sin so that we could live for him and with him. Heaven is icing on the cake. Why would you want to miss life with your creator for life with created things? Because those created things are going to fail you. I promise. We have an inadequate view of Jesus because we simply want to relegate him into a position on a cross or in a manger not on a throne. We have a small view of Christ and a big view of ourselves because we can't stand for to have someone else on the throne of our lives other than ourselves. And let me help you with something. You never were. You never were. He made you. He died to save you. He died to save me. And I'm telling you, if I don't see him, as creator, savior, king, lord, sustainer, life giver, I will keep him on the cross, not where he's rightfully placed on the throne. Please don't miss Jesus. And here's what verse 14 shows us. If Jesus, the person of Jesus, is not simply a part of creation, he's the creator, Jesus came to make God known. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here's the beauty of the gospel. Every other world religion will tell you that there's a pursuit and a way to get to God. And if you work hard enough, you will make it. Here's what Christianity teaches. It's the truth. God came down the mountain to dwell with you to make things right. Why are you working so hard? You're never going to be enough to please him. He's already done the work. He loves you already. Just rest in him. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The purpose of the coming of the Son of God was to show us who God is and reveal his love for his creation. Look at what verse 15 continues with. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John knew. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. I said this last night, and it caught me today. Every breath I take, every step I take, every friendship I have, every moment my heart beats is a gift from God. Grace upon grace. Not only in the midst of all of that am I sinful, in the midst of all of my sin, he's loving me. Still to this day. So the words that I have for you today, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, but he has made him known. You want to know God's character? You want to know God's nature? Watch Jesus suffer and die on the cross and come out of the grave and tell me he doesn't love you. Tell me he's mean. Tell me he's vengeful. And I'll tell you, he's vengeful for his own glory. He will have no rival in our life. Grace upon grace. I would encourage you with this. Everybody look at me. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, when you go to bed tonight and when you wake up tomorrow morning, thank Him for being your Savior. Remind yourself of this good news, that the God who made you died to save you so that you could have life with Him now. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. It starts the moment you die to yourself and trust Christ. So here's my question. Have you believed in Christ and have you experienced new life in him I told you the story I met Christ and I've never been the same have you trusted him I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that tonight Daryl and I and Joe are here there's other leaders you can talk to if you've never trusted Christ you're confused you have questions about who this Jesus is from the scriptures and what's happened in your life Come find one of us. We'd love to talk to you. Please, listen. Don't put it, don't pack up yet. Listen to me. When you see Jesus for who he is, you will never settle for less than who he is. When you see him for who he is, you'll never settle for anything less than him. So what are you settling for? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this night. I thank you for your word that is perfect and sufficient, powerful, full of hope and joy and truth. And Father, I thank you for the grace that is ours, for the hope that is ours in Christ. And I pray right now that if there's someone here who's never made a decision to trust Christ, they play church, they can't wait to get out of here because they're so nervous, their palms are sweaty, they know they have to do something. They gotta respond, they have to talk to somebody. God, would you give them boldness? Move in their heart. Call us to a fresh faith in who Jesus is, in the person and the work of Christ. We have nothing without him and we will never be anything without him. Thank you for this night and your word. I pray it's been fruitful in our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our discussion questions for tonight.